So, if you don't have a plan, then what do we do now? Destiny asked as she walked along beside me on her way to exit the Minotaur had set up. I'm thinking, I sighed. What about Relic? Abigail asked from behind me. Can he just teleport her into the sun or something? You know he doesn't hurt people. He might freak someone out, but he's not going to actually hurt or kill anyone. And I'm not going to be the one to ask him to, I told her. Best I could get out of him was to zap all my expensive stuff out of the apartment and hide it somewhere so the maid doesn't go break my shit. Now, Abigail? Yep. Wait, what about my shit? She suddenly shrieked at the realization. That's my whole life in that shop! Don't worry, she's probably not even thinking about you right now. I think I probably just jumped to the top of a shit list after what I had to do to get it down here, I explained. But she just stopped dead in her tracks with this wide look of worry in her eye. Hey, Abigail, it's gonna be okay. She's not gonna mess with your shop, I promise. But, but how do you know? She asked, her voice starting to tremble and her eyes starting to get misty as she stood in place and nervously fidgeted with the end of a braid. You don't know what I had to do to afford that place. Oh, boy. Oh, help. Dest, Louis, come help me out with this, please. I begged as she started to tear up. Hey, what's going on? Abigail, what's wrong? Louis asked as he got over to us. She thinks the maid and the angels are going to mess up her shop and ruin her business, I told him. Oh, Abby, no. Destiny said as she knelt down beside her. They all hate Jose way more than you. What? what? I don't hate Jose, she said with a sniffle. Ha no, I mean they'll be more pissed at Jose than they will be at you. You're probably not even on their radar right now. Besides, they still want Jose on their side. And they knew that doing something like that would hurt their chances. And they did- Destiny, say that again, please. I interrupted her before she could finish. What did you just say? Huh? That they still want you on their side? Isn't that right? You said that Yahweh was trying to get you to hype him up, right? She asked as she looked up from Abigail to face me. I think I'll just figure out our plan B. Hey Abigail, punch me in the face. I need a good, deep black eye. Huh? Why? She asked with another small sniffle. Ugh, Destiny, rock my ship for me. Jose, I'm not punching it. She started to say and then I woke up on the ground. Ah, ah! I groaned as I rolled over off my back and slowly got back to my feet. What the hell happened? I asked over a pound into my headache. Why, you said you wanted someone to punch you in the eye. Louis said from behind me. Did you guys just let me land on concrete? It kind of caught us all off guard, Destiny admitted. Sorry, and why did you want someone to punch you anyway? Okay, right. Here's the story. Ow. I got pissed at you for screwing up the plan. There was an argument, things were said, hands were thrown, I took off and joined Yahweh because screw you guys, right? Everyone on the same page so far? I asked once I was done explaining. Yeah, I think so. But what are you planning? Destiny asked nervously as everyone else gathered around. Okay, I'm in, but I have conditions. I say later that night as I found myself standing in front of Yahweh once again. Have yourself a bit of a scuffle there, did you? He asked from that concrete throne of his as he pointed at my black eye. This change of heart wouldn't have to do with some dissension in the enemy ranks by any chance. I don't have to explain myself to you. But I did think about what you said. I don't think things are going to change for the paranormals around here with Account and Dirty Work Inc. running the show. This is for them, not for you and not for me. But the condition is you come clean about everything, not a single secret, not one twist of truth. I want to know everything, I said as I walked further into the room. And I do mean everything. You're referring to Abigail, that pet vampire of yours, aren't you? He asked as he finally rose up out of his throne. I suppose it's best you learn now rather than later. They took that phone of yours before you came in, yes? Yeah, they took my damn phone. Now talk. Hmm. Yes. Well then, alright. 
he said as he cleared his throat. Do you know where they came from? Those things? Uh, you mean the vampires, like Abigail? They came from other vampires, I guess. I remember Jekyll said something about a metal and particles or something. What did he say? That the particles that make the paranormal possible, and the vampires have a fake version of some metal in them with the particles in it. Mm-hmm, so you have been paying attention. But the question remains, if vampires come from other vampires, then where did the first one come from? He asked as he walked up next to me. Not likely to just spring out of the ground, right? Yeah, I guess you have a point. Let me see that knife of yours, he said, holding his hand out. The one Hook gave you. Give it here. Oh, uh, here you go. Pulling it from its home inside my waistband and handing it over without a fuss. This marvelous metal the blade was infused with recalcum. Do you know what it really is? Simply put, it's little more than a vessel for those particles. When all is said and done, it's the most precious metal in the universe. If anything, there's no effective way to set its value. Literally priceless. So do you know why that hotel your brother works for hands it out freely to be infused with these weapons? I uh, actually never thought about it. I answered as I watched him pass the knife back and forth in his hands. It's so people can kill vampires with them. They aren't as welcome elsewhere as they are here. The hotel's first course of action regarding them is little more than eradication. And I'm the reason for that. You see, Atlantis was a real place once upon a time. Long before Plato first mentioned it. An island nation far more developed than anywhere else at the time. The reason they were able to do that was because of that metal. Someone gave a gang of bandits information how to obtain the metal from the hotel before it was crafted into those bars they carry around, or woven into structures that give the hotel those marvelous properties. Once they had it, they fled and built their own nation to the west of the coast, in the Atlantic Ocean. But they became greedy. A property of that metal is its ability to seemingly draw more of itself from nothingness. They thought they could somehow use that property to create more from themselves. However, it simply doesn't work like that. You see, something happens when you try to game the system with the metal and create more of it. It went wrong. The metal did begin to reproduce itself, but not as they intended. Some who it touched dissolved away into puddles. Most, actually. But a few, the metal infused with them and made them something different. Something dangerous. Something contagious. Those things are dangerous, Jose. More than you think. The fact of the matter is that the metal in those particles, they aren't fake. They're inversed. Polar opposites of particles, Jackal explained to you. They aren't counterfeit. They're just from somewhere else. That's why if you hurt them bad enough with this precious metal, it will definitely kill them. It's the only thing that can for sure. As he finished, he flipped the knife around and handed it back to me. So how does that... Those things... They're not human, Jose. They're monsters. Infected husks of what used to be a person. They don't deserve an ounce of your sympathy. What anyone does to them after the fact should be of no concern to you at all. He told me as he sat back on his throne. I believe Scheidenfrauder should be returning here very soon. I sent her off on a quick errand not too long ago. Oh, great. I looked around the room for cover, but before I could, poof. Went about like you said it would, the maid said as soon as she appeared in the center of the chamber. Her once white glove stained red with blood and her tone soft and calm again. Bigger than I thought it'd be, though. Ah, well, it can't be helped, 
We gave him his chance. He always said as he leaned back in his throne. Oh yes, some good news. It seems Jose has had a change of heart as the result of some tension following your performance. He just knocked me out. I complained from the corner I'd wedged myself into. Hey, hey, fancy seeing you here. I nearly whimpered as her eyes fell on me, blood still dripping from her gloves. Hey, hey, go team Yahweh, right? I asked her, holding up a fist in the air. He's so full of shit. She suddenly blurted out a few seconds of staring me down. I bet he got one of them to punch him in the eye to sell the bit. He's not going to risk his life like he did and just flip a coin like that. She went on as she walked to where I was. Where it was cowering. So just fess up. What's your scheme this time? You doing a double agent thing or something? A double... What? No! Why the hell would I waste my time on something that stu- Look, I'm not trying to trick you, I insisted. Whatever. Believe me. Don't believe me. Now skin off my back. She sighed as the maid costume faded away and replaced by a normal clothes again. I'm going to my room, she added, her neat black hair fraying out as she walked. She is right. I have to admit I do have my own concerns about your sincerity. Sedition and treachery doesn't suit you. I'm going to need proof of your commitment, do you understand? Yahweh said as he stood back up. Uh, proof, you say? Yes. Proof. And I think I have an idea. Let's see you leverage that famous charm of yours to our advantage. He answered as he paced around me. Sobek is going to be a cornerstone in this community before long. I want him on my side. You make that happen. I'll be a believer. Oh, uh, Sobek, huh? Lizard-looking fellow, terrifying voice, lots of teeth about... Yay, God damn tall. I asked as I held my hand as high above my head as I could. Indeed. Schreidenfraude will be accompanying you to make sure no foul play is involved, as I'm sure you can understand. He explained as he stopped in place. Once the sun goes down, of course. He added when he noticed that the maid's head poked around from the corner. So, I guess we're going to be working together now, huh? I asked nervously as I walked down the sidewalk of the dimly lit street. So, uh... What were you up to before I got here? I went on when she didn't answer. Tying up a loose end, she said bluntly. Oh, uh, okay then. So you're not buying this double cross thing, huh? You're still mad about the shirt thing, huh? I'm still mad about the shirt thing, she said sharply before I could finish. I swear I thought you'd be wearing something underneath it, I mumbled shamefully. You know what? I went on as I stepped in front of her. Now you... I owe you a free one. Take a shot, I told her, positioning my head to an optimal punching height for her by standing on my toes. You want me to punch you in the face? You already have one black eye. Are you stupid? Probably, but it's not even about the shirt thing. Well, maybe still a little. But the whole thing, it run me the wrong way from the start. It should never happen in the first place. I'll take whatever I've got coming. I explained as I stayed balanced awkwardly on my toes. It wasn't until she balled her fist up and drew it back that the idea occurred to me that maybe that was not the smartest thing in the world that I could have done. But by then I was committed, so I tightened up and waited for the axe to fall. But it didn't. I cracked one eye to see her standing there, fist still in the air, but not moving. Come on, the suspense is killing me, I prodded, wanting to just get it over with. You get that I can literally put my fist straight through your face, don't you? She cautioned as I heard her knuckles crack as she tightened her grip. I'm painfully aware of that, thank you, I answered with my nearly shaken voice. What in the hell is all this? A rolling voice suddenly asks, making me turn and realize we just stopped in front of the entrance to Sobek's lair. Now Mr. Page was standing in the opening, watching the witness unfold. 
Oh, hey, Mr. Page, we're actually here to t I barked as my head snapped back from the maid jabbing me in the nose. Oh, oh my god, why? I groaned as I rolled around on the cold grass clutching my nose in my hands. You literally told me to. I barely heard his say over the racket I was making. So you're the one stirring up all the commotion, I heard Mr. Page drone on as I continued to kick my feet in pain and frustration. Nice to finally put a face to the fable. He went on as he reached out to shake her hand. What can I help you two with? Oh, ah, ah, well, I was hoping to talk to your boss, the answers as I got back to my feet. To speak to me is to speak to him. As his representative, I can communicate on his behalf. So please proceed. He explained, maintaining that statue-like stillness of his. Oh, uh, okay, um, what's a good place to start? I thought out loud as I rubbed my nose. So, I think I've had a change of heart here. I know Yahweh might not seem like the most appealing business partner, but I thought about what Sobek is trying to do around here. Modernize the paranormal community and make things better for them. Give them more of a comfortable life. I don't see that happening with the Count running the show. Things really haven't changed around here in forever, right? So, I think, at least for now, maybe do a trial run where... We try things a little different. I don't think there's an avenue where we fight our way out of this. I'm pretty sure it's better to cut our losses, swallow our pride, and see if we can make this whole thing work. Focus on doing things best for the other paranormals around here. Once I was done making my case, Mr. Page didn't do anything for the longest time. After a while, he finally took a deep breath and spoke. I am to understand that you resolve the issue with the creature in the fault line? He asked, turning the face to the maid. I said no more sacrifices, he said over his dead body. There won't be any more sacrifices, she answered bluntly. I see. Well, in light of this and other recent events, we are inclined to accept your offer. For the time being. Mr. Page said before turning and disappearing back into the tunnel. We'll be in touch. He called back to us from the darkness. You're joking, he always said in disbelief once we were back. Just like that? I couldn't believe it either. He really does have a knack for that kind of stuff. The maid told him as she walked by and back to her room. Ha! Huh. See, that's why I wanted you on board with us, Jose. Well done. Very well done, he shouted, slapping his knee. Yeah, yeah, deal's a deal. What's the real plan? Ah, yes. Do you still have his phone? He asked over my shoulders to the man standing guard near the entrance. Yes, sir. Still in the box where he put it when he arrived. The man answered with a nod. Hmm, all right then. To put it simply, the new plan is the old plan. With an extra step. You see, the world we live in is exceedingly difficult from the world in which I first rose to power. Undoubtedly, most of my worshippers wouldn't accept I am who I am. The people have become too credulous, you see. Even the people who might think gullible would be, more often than not, hard to convince. That's where the paranormal world comes in. I intend to gradually bring them into the light, so to speak. As society acclimates to their presence and eventually accepts them and the nature of the paranormal, I will reveal myself to the world with them at my back. With their support as my validation to my identity, I'll retake my old place at the top of the mountain. Is that it? Nothing else? I asked once I suspected he was done. I believe so. What makes you... Why phrase it like that? He asked with his eyes narrowed suspiciously. Son of a bitch! The maid suddenly shouted from her room off to the side, before she came darting around the corner holding her phone up in the air. Because these days, little Bluetooth microphones connect automatically and have a pretty decent range, I said, 
reaching into my pocket and producing the tiny mic that had been feeding into the phone the whole time. You rotten little... Ah, no, you stop right there, buddy. I stopped him before he could finish. You had yours. This is my evil monologue this time. The whole time, everything you said was getting streamed live to the entire local paranormal community through this interesting new app, kindly provided by our mutual acquaintance, Sobek. All it took was dropping a quick line to the most popular paranormal podcast on the platform, courtesy of our friends at Brooklyn Felonius. They couldn't have been more excited to help. Called up Sobek himself, who'd apparently agreed to help any way he could. So the whole winning him over, totally staged. But I bet what you're really wondering right now is where I found the balls to stand here right now and do this right in front of you like I am. It had crossed my mind. He said through gritted teeth as his hands began to glow white hot and melt the armrest of his concrete throne. Well, because you kind of didn't drone on for as long as I expected you would, so I had to stall for time, I said as I checked the time. Nice watch, right? Destiny got it for me on her first date. Solid titanium. Keeps great time. Made in Denmark, actually. I added, glancing over the now flabbergasted maid. The thing about Relic is he's not the fighting type, and Hephaestus was never going to be much help against the maid over there. I knew that. But it just occurred to me, you get Hephaestus and his... talent for fixing things and put him together with Relic, and consider that all you have to do is move enough rubble to get to the door, well... The... door? He asked, a tone of fear spilling into his voice as he said the words. That's right, the door. I said as I looked down at my watch one more time. Look at that, time's up. As I finished speaking and lowered my watch, I could feel an electrical charge surge through the air as the rumble of a resounding explosion sounded in the distance. What did you do? He always snarled as the ground beneath our feet began to shake. But before I could say anything else, there was that searing flash of light and heat that filled the room. The moment my vision returned, I could see the cause of the flash. There he was standing in the middle of the chamber. Fudo Mu. But this time he looked different. He was shorter and blue with solid red hair and piercing red and yellow eyes. In the moment I glanced over at the maid who had a look of horror etched on her face like I'd never seen before. She stood there, frozen in place. Whether it was a nervous twitch or an attempt to escape, I couldn't tell. But the second her hand barely shook, he was already in front of her. I didn't even notice a move. By the next second, he kicked both of her legs out from under her, bending the knees sideways with an obnoxious snap. The instant her back hit the ground, he planted his foot deep into the center of her chest and all the way down to the floor. There was a horrible, wet gurgling noise as a torrent of blood erupted from her mouth before she fell completely still. I would have turned away in revulsion, but everything happened so fast that I didn't have time to make the choice. The next thing I knew, there was a bright flash from behind me, and I turned to see that once again, Yahweh had vanished. Fudo, confident that the maid was no longer an issue, took a moment to look around the throne room. While he did that, I took a second to run over to the maid. The state she was in was so much worse or close. Small streams of blood ran down from her eyes, like thick crimson tears, as the crater in her chest rose and fell. She gasped in agony for air. That's not going to be enough to kill you, is it? I quietly asked down to her. She didn't speak, but gave her head a slow, painful shake as her glassy eyes gazed up at the ceiling. I figured as much. Can't poof just yet either, huh? When she shook her head again, I sat down beside her and picked her shaking hand off the chamber floor. Then while you're stuck here, just listen, I said as I scooted forward. I get how you feel. Your mom ditched you. You thought your dad left you behind. I can't imagine how lonely you've been all these years. But that asshole was just playing you. That's what he does. Just listen to some of Abigail's stories about him. 
I don't know everything you've been through or what he might have told you, but I know one thing for sure, and it's that the Count, your dad, he loves you like he's known you his entire life. I was talking to him about you the other night and told him that you like go too, just like he does. You know what he did? No. The maid wheezed as she shook her head softly. He cried his eyes out. He couldn't even finish the conversation. He was willing to lose everything he had if it meant having to hurt you to keep it. Despite everything you were willing to do and everything you were saying, he wouldn't lay a finger on you. And that's how I know if you suck it up, put your big girl apron on and ask, he'll leave all this behind in the past and never bring it up again. You'll have a home, a nice home, sisters, a dad that loves you more than anything in the world, a clean slate, a whole new life. Or you can stay the course and go throw your lot in with Yahweh again and hope it works out better next time. I told her as I looked over at Fudo, who had taken to patiently watching the conversation unfold. It's up to you, I said as I put a hand down and stood up from the ground. Well? Once I asked, she just looked back at me for a second before... Poof. And then she was gone. Should I go after her? Fudo asked, his voice breaking the lingering silence. Nah. Just leave her alone for now. I think we should worry about Yahweh, don't you? I asked in response as I glanced away from where the maid had been resting to look him in the eye. You should reconsider being my vassal. You are very wise, he told me as he stared back. I want it back, I said once I finally worked up the courage. A secret you took from me that you were supposed to... Whole memories from me and other people, and I want it back. I got you out. You owe me now. Before he said anything back, he held up his fingers. Four years. Even four years, you still want it back. You will have it. He told me before he vanished in another flash of white heat, leaving me standing alone in the empty concrete chamber. Jose, are you okay? Destiny asked once I walked through the back door of the manor. I just want to go to bed, I said as I passed by. Okay, well, you might want to wait. She said anxiously, causing me to stop on my way to her room. Diego woke up a little while ago. He's still not the best right now. Nehushtan and Victor are up there right now with him if you want to go see. Yeah. Yeah, okay. I answered after thinking for a second. Real quick, then I'll let him rest. Oh, oi! Jekyll wheezed when he noticed me walk into the room. Damn it, mate. You look like hell. What happened here? He asked as he slowly lifted his hand to point at my black eye and still bloody nose. Oh, Louis punched me in the eye. Then the maid punched me in the nose. No, I meant your face. Was you always that ugly, mate? <laughs> no laughing yet. He groaned as he rolled back a little. It's good to have you back. I was worried for a while. I told him as Tom adjusted some medicine beside the bed and the Hushton mixed up some strange liquid in a cup. Just wanted to check on you. I'll let you rest now. I added as I turned to leave his room. Hold on. He suddenly said as I felt his hand reach out and grab my wrist. Before you go, I gotta tell you something important. That maid, she didn't number on me, didn't she? He asked, glancing down at his chest. But don't go too hard on her right. I'm pretty sure she's the cat's daughter. J Jekyll, have you had any conversation with anyone about anything since you've been awake? I asked skeptically. What? No. What you got you asking? Mm. So you put that together when? Before you blacked out? After you came to? Bit of both, I think. Hazel eyes, black hair, fangs, stronger than all holy hell. Be damn on if she wouldn't, wouldn't it? 
You have a good point. And I relinquish with a sigh. Hey, Jackal? Yeah, mate, what's the matter? You remember when you told me you wanted to help the paranormal community and then the rest of the world if you could? Vividly. He answered as he took the cup Nehushtan handed him and drank the weird fluid. Oh, bloody Christ. The hell is that? Tastes like it rot toenails off for dead men. He gagged. Well, I swear, whatever I have to do, I'm going to make sure you get whatever you need to do just that. So get some rest. I told him as I left the room and headed to Destiny's room again. But before I got there, a thought occurred to me. I didn't want to. I'd have rather just went to sleep since I'd felt like I'd been up for a whole week straight. But as long as I was up, I figured I'd best rip off the bandage. After making my way downstairs again, I found myself at the far end of the hall leading to the lounge where the Count was supposed to be. It took a minute or two standing there by myself as I tried to think up the words to tell him that the maid vanished and I had no ideas where she went or how bad she was hurt. Oh boy, here we go. <sighs> I sighed as I walked down the hall and reached the doorknob. But before I could open, I could hear sobbing from the other side. It was the Count. Ah, great. He probably thinks Fudo just killed his daughter or something. Since Yahweh ran off and I made it back alive. I thought to myself as I stood there holding the knob. Fuck it. I did everything I could. I told myself as I went to twist the knob and push the door open, but then heard another sound. What the hell was that? I thought as I slowly cracked the door and peeked inside. Son of a bitch! I screamed inside my head as I found the maid and the count standing in the middle of the room with their arms wrapped around each other. Not wanting to screw anything up, I tried to quietly sneak away. But whilst I was trying, the maid noticed me. But she just sniffled. Gave me a quick nod and a smile, and let me go without saying anything. What's going on? Destiny asked as I carefully closed the door behind me. Shh, I hoisted her, putting a finger over her lips. First, go get Prophecy and poof down here with her, I told her as I nudged her a little further away from the lounge. Um, okay then, she said before vanishing and showing back up a few seconds later with Prophecy. So... What is it? She asked again. Um, you know what? No context. Just make sure nobody gets hurt. I told them as I stepped out of the way and let them walk into the lounge. I made it as far as the kitchen before the scene sunk in and the commotion came roaring out of the lounge. Like I said, much life in this house, I heard Mika say as I passed by. I glanced in to see her sitting at the island counter. Abigail sitting in front of her, she braided her long, walnut-colored hair. Oh, hey. I didn't... Nobody told me you were here, I said as I stopped. Yes, I thought I would take the chance to spend time with Abigail, and now, because of you, perhaps get to know this sister I just learned of. I've never had a sibling before. It is very exciting to think about, No? She asked as she looked down at Abigail before saying something in a different language, to which Abigail nodded. What did she say? She said it looks like her family's grown a lot lately. Abigail answered as Mika kept braiding her hair. New sister for me, new brother for you. New br- Oh. Oh. I said once I realized what she meant, and my eyes started to water a little bit. I'm- I'm gonna go try and rest for a little while. I told him before I tried to walk away, but before I could, Abigail hopped off the stool. No, you wait! Mika scolded as she tugged on her rope-like hair, pulling Abigail's head back a little. Get back over here and let me tie this up first. Ow! Ow! Stop! She complained as Mika wrapped the scrunchie around her hair. Uh, wait a second, she said as she ran over to me. What happened to Yahweh? He got away again. Fudo's looking for him now, and I don't think he's letting them go this time. They didn't seem very happy about everything that went down, so... We'll probably have a lead on him soon, I imagine. I answered as best as I could, as I tried to wipe my eyes before she could notice. Oh. Okay. 
She sighed as her shoulders dropped a little. Is everything okay? She asked up at me. I don't know. I just realized my leg was killing me, but now it isn't. I told her as I looked down at where the piece of bone struck in earlier. What happened to your leg? Abigail asked nervously as she looked down at the roughly bandaged wound. Oh, that explosion. Piece of bone got stuck in me. I think it's getting infected. Come to think of it, I'm going to run up and see Nehushtan about it just in case. I explained as I turned to leave, but before I could, I felt a small hand grip my waist like a vice, not letting me move. Jose, I was standing in front of you. Did that piece of bone pass through me? She asked, the voice starting to shake. I, uh, I, I don't know. Might have. If it did, that would make me a vamp. I started to ask, but before I could, she had already torn the bandage away and was glaring down at my leg. Oh, no. Oh, oh, no, 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 no. She repeated my words as she looked down at the rotting hole in my leg. His long black streaks snaked out from it in all directions. Abigail, what's going on? I asked, fear now audible in my voice to match hers. Abigail, please say something, I'm scared. By then, the uproar had reached the lounge and had everyone appearing all over the kitchen to see what was going on. The icy stillness in their eyes wasn't going a long way towards making me feel any better as they all stared down at my leg. And then Abigail finally said it. Jose, you're dying. The hell I am, I bellowed into her face. Get it off me, the whole thing. Take it, take the leg, I demanded as I sat on the floor and pushed my leg towards her. It doesn't work that way, Jose. It's too far up. It's in your whole body now, she told me, tears starting to well up in her eyes. We, I can make it quick if you, if you want me to. She said as a voice trailed off. Suck my ass, make it quick. Abigail, you yanked my goddamn leg off right now. I demanded again as I pulled my shorts off to clear the area of my hip. Do it! I repeated as I heard something clatter across the tile floor from the kitchen. Suddenly, Abigail's attention left me as she glanced down at the floor before she reached down and picked whatever it was up. As she held the small knife up, her hand began to sizzle and pop like it was being cooked. Jose, do you have an orichalcum knife? She asked as she looked at it. What? Y yeah. Hook gave it to me a little while back, but it's too small to cut my- I started to tell her, but by the time I got to the yeah pot, the knife was already buried in the center of my open wound, all the way down to the bone. Abigail! I tried to shout, but by then she wasn't paying attention to anything I was saying anymore. Destiny, come here and hold his hand. He's about to- I heard. I heard her say as she waved the now crying Destiny down next to us. About to? I asked through gritted teeth as the throbbing in my leg sent waves of agony up my spine. But before she could answer any questions, it answered itself. It was almost instant. All at once, it felt like someone poured molten lead through my veins as patches of skin on my leg began to redden and blister, then cook as something inside my body began to burn. Hey, wake up. I hear a voice in my ears say, Come on, wake up. You got hit by a truck. You've been in a coma for months now. Ugh, I groaned as I rolled over. Can you leave me alone, please? I almost died. I said to the maid, who'd been leaning over, whispering in my ear whilst I slept. What the hell happened? You passed out from the pain, she answered as she dropped down onto the bed next to me. You know how many tell someone you're awake? No, wait. Wait. Just give me a minute, I just woke up. Once they start crying, and I know they will, I'm gonna start crying too. Just staying here and being different with me for a minute? I asked her. Speaking of almost dying, how's your chest? Oh. It still hurts a little. I'll be okay, though. She told me as she looked down at her shirt. Still a footprint there. Wanna see? I'm gonna have to pass. Your loss. What about your leg? 
she asked as she pointed over at the fresh bundle of gauze. Let me see. Oh, oh shit, that's a... Oof, sorry. She apologized as she covered the area back up. No, what's going on? I asked as I moved the bandages away. Ah, shit. I copied her when I saw the ghoulish scar across my thigh. Wait. Why the hell is there a scar? How long have I been out? Because? Nehushtan answered as she walked into the room. Jackal's ridiculous biology is a nightmare to work with. But a regular person like yourself? Psh. She said as she brushed the imaginary dirt off her clothes. No problem. I'm a healing goddess after all. Give me some credit. Probably going to be some lingering soreness for a while, though. Well, that answers that. Okay, let's do this. I told the maid with a deep sigh. Bring them in. Don't do that to me! Abigail yelled as she kicked the side of my bed and nearly launched it across the room. Us! Don't do that to us! I apologized that I straightened myself back out on the bed, now that it was a lot closer to the window. You be careful! Destiny scolded as she pawed at me, making sure I was in one piece. Jose, be honest with me. Okay, okay I will. Did you really make a movie reference when you thought you were about to die? She asked me sternly. <laughs> oh, you caught that, huh? Take it, take the leg. Orlando Jones, evolution. I answered as I tried to stay serious and not smile. I'm sorry. I, I promise I'll be more serious next time I'm dying. Jose, you don't get it. In the past several days, I thought I was about to watch you die twice. She said, as her voice shook a little before she broke into a full crying fit. Yep, I told you. I said to the maid as my eyes started to water, whilst I was trying to look up at the ceiling to keep the tears from running down my cheeks. Oh shit, you're right, it's not fair, I'm sorry, I said as I wrapped my arms around her. Yes, we need to fix that. I suddenly heard a hook say from behind the crowd that had gathered in the small room. Sorry I'm late. I was out late with the crew dealing with the remaining angels, you see. Anyway, there's an event in your honor tonight, young lad. Be sure you clean yourself up and get ready by seven. He instructed with a toothy grin. And mark my words, son. You've earned it. He added before turning and exiting the room without another word. Hell's he mean by that? Hey, what are you shitheads not telling me? I asked in confusion as I looked around at everyone who also had smiles of their own. Even the maid. Abigail? Nah, -uh, can't tell, she said, shaking her head, sending waves down a long braid. You'll just have to wait and see tonight, she insisted as she followed everyone else out into the hall. Hey, you wait a second, I said, pointing at the maid. There's still stuff I want to say to you before you go. Everyone stopped for a second, apparently not expecting that. But she listened and stayed behind. Sit back down, I told her, scooting back towards the wall to give her some space. What are you up to? She asked suspiciously. A lot. First thing is, I know you know where Yahweh might be. You need to tell them. You can't be out there running around anymore. You know that. I know that. I said before taking a long enough pause to give her time to nod. The next thing, your stuff is in my apartment. I couldn't leave it there sitting by itself. There's a new PS4 in there and a bunch of games in there with it. Time to upgrade, I told her, which caused a confused tilt of her head. Nah, not done yet, I said as she tried to open her mouth to speak. You fucked up. You fucked up big. I'm glad you came around in the end. But you damn near killed Jekyll, and I almost died trying to handle you and your bullshit several times. You're gonna have to take your lumps. So I wanna make a deal. What deal? She said, cutting her eyes at me. You take whatever draconian sentence Fudo and the rest of the paranormal community hands down. Which I can almost guarantee is gonna be your ass. Or there's my alternative. You go with that. I'll talk them into going with that and damage several instead, I explained, pointing to the injured spot on the chest. What's the alternative? 
she asked cautiously. You work part-time at Abigail's shop. You help her do whatever she needs, whenever she needs it. And you wear the maid outfit during business hours. I revealed with a smile. That, that's it? She asked as her eyes opened wide. Just work at a prop store in the stupid costume? No, there's a second part. You go to regular sessions with Dr. Angela. I can't afford it. The Count would definitely pay for them if you agreed to go. I interrupted her. You've got thousands of years worth of baggage. You need to go, and she's pretty good. Even Abigail agreed to give it a try. So? Yeah, fine. I'll go. She said as she gave up and folded her arms. Anything else? She asked sharply. Mm-hmm. Just one more thing. But it's a question, not a condition. You have to answer, though. Yeah, okay. Go ahead. Ask. She sighed as she let her arms fall back down to her sides. Okay. Just as soon as destiny and prophecy stop eavesdropping, I shouted to the hall, causing a quick eep and a soft hiss as they both vanish. All three of them were pretty bad about that. Hey, what was fate like? She asked suddenly. Oh, uh, well, I didn't know her that well. Well, when you get the chance, maybe ask them to tell you about her. Something to get you guys on better speaking terms, you know? I answered before asking. Now, my question. You lied, didn't you? Huh? What do you mean? Lied about what? She asked, back in confusion. You didn't forget your name in the camp. You never had one, did you? As I asked the question, I knew I'd accidentally stepped right on a nerve. What makes you think? She snapped, almost standing up off the bed, but threw my hands up to stop her. Don't hit me, I'm trying to help, I said, easing her back to a calmer place. What I mean is that you don't have to go by Schadenfreude anymore. That's just being cruel to yourself. So? She asked, wanting me to get to the point. So you can pick your own name, you know, something that suits you. Oh, oh yeah, um, I guess you're right. Something that suits me. She thought out loud as she plopped back onto the bed and stared up at the ceiling. She just laid there for a while as her eyes darted back and forth, mumbling to herself quietly. Something that suits me. Destiny. Prophecy. Fate. Faint, prophecy, destiny. I think I know, she suddenly shouted, shooting up off her back. That's great. Now can you tell me without scaring the shit out of me? I asked as my heart pounded like a drum. I want to be hope. Names. They're all things that look to the future, right? Destiny, prophecy, fate. All things about the future. So is hope. I want to be hope. She said in excitement as it crept into her voice. Okay. Hope. I said as I held out my hand. Nice to meet you. I'm Jose. It's a long story. Nice to meet you, Jose. She said. A genuine smile on her face for the first time I think since we've met. There's something else, isn't there? She asked after noticing me thinking about one more question. Okay, yeah. One last thing. For real this time. What is it? She questioned a little more cautiously this time. Okay, this is gonna sound weird, but can you show me what you looked like as a child? Can I? Huh? She stammered, visibly confused by the question. I guess, she finally said as she slowly changed into a young girl with floor-length black hair and raggedy ancient-looking clothes. I knew it! Were you doing that stupid hallucination thing and making me see young versions of yourself to fuck with me? I barked the second I recognized the girl. What? No. I didn't. Not on purpose, at least. She told me she changed back to normal and plopped back down on the bed. No, no, don't pass over that last part. What do you mean not on purpose? I pressed, leaning in about an inch away from the side of her head. Little girl was you randomly popping up all over the place. Why? At first, she didn't answer. 
She just sat there swinging her legs back and forth off the side of the bed, humming softly while she stared up at the ceiling. After a while, she let out a heavy groan and vanished. A few seconds later, she was back and holding the book in her hand. Here. There was a survivor from Denmark, and they wrote a book about it. She said as she handed me the black-covered book with the word Winter Camp written across it in bright red. I was more dead than alive through most of this. And it says they're still seeing my hallucinations most of that time. I think it can happen subconsciously sometimes. You think you were subconsciously making you see visions of me as a child as I cry for help? Who knows? She said before I could finish. Right out though, right? Wait. The fuck you mean survivor? Later that night, I was in front of the mirror in the room that I'd eventually realized was the one next to Jekyll's. Standing there in my box as I stared at my reflection, at the new revolting scar on my leg, and then at the old ones running across my face, then at the still mildly scabbed over patches on my elbows from the night I'd bailed off the bike running from Croc, then I found myself thinking, the hell am I going to look like in a year? Hey, Jose, you almost ready? Destiny called through the door. Oh, yeah, just got out of the shower, getting dressed now. I called back as I picked up the black dress pants she'd left out for me. That's... How much did you spend on these pants? I asked as she saw the fancy logo on the tag that I couldn't begin to recognize. Then looked down at the fancy black leather shoes sitting on the floor. Don't worry about it. Destiny, how much? I asked again. But I didn't get an answer. Just the sound of a poof. Great, now I gotta Google the logos to figure out how much to PayPal on later. God damn it. And the belt's nice. Oh, look at Jose. Bell of the ball, ain't ya? Madison mocked as I walked down the stairs to see her waiting for me as she stood next to Relic. Hey, where's everyone else? I asked when I looked around and didn't see anyone else in sight. They're waiting for us. Relic answered as he reached down and adjusted my collar that was apparently inside out on one side. You haven't seen my watch, have you? No, I'll help you find it later. Come on, everyone is waiting. As you once said, take my hand. We're off to Never Neverland. He said this as he reached forward, and the second my hand touched his, I found myself standing in the middle of an old village. Huh? Oh, hey, I remember this place, I said to myself as I looked around. The hell are we doing here, though? It's a very special occasion. A familiar voice spoke from behind us, hidden by the dark. Hey, hey, Tiger Lily, is that you? You guessed it, she answered cheerfully as he stepped into the light of the burning torch. What's that you were in? I asked as I saw her clothes. It's ceremonial, she told me, a small smile on her face as she spoke. You'll see, she said as she waved for us to follow her, leading us towards the center of the village. Once we were further in, I could start to recognize people. Destiny, Rissa, Abigail, Louie, Chris, Johnny, Prophecy, Hope, Mika... My asshole slammed shut for a second when I saw Athena standing there. Then I glanced over at Louis, the hitman who had almost shot me in the head, and figured, what the hell, and kept looking around. I looked at all the members of the tribe as they stood in a large circle. Then I noticed Mr. Page was standing there in that neat suit of his. Huh, wonder what he's doing here, I thought to myself as my eyes passed over him. Eventually I found Ryan and the girl... My, A little further down was Han. Han, what the hell are you doing here? I asked as I ran over to him. His presence getting to me for some reason. This is an important day. Very important day. I don't think it would be a good idea for you to miss it if you don't have to. He answered cryptically. Does everyone know what's happening here but me? You'll understand soon. He said with his own smile as he pulled the sleeves tight on my shirt and dusted off the shoulders. Uh, Oak? Wait, 
before this is all over, we really need to talk. I said back to him over my shoulder, causing a little confusion to leak into his expression. A few minutes later, I heard a voice speak out over the soft rustle in the crowd. Everyone! Everyone! It's time! Hook's voice rang out as he stepped up next to me in the middle of the circle. How are you doing, boy? Leg holding together? He leaned over and asked quietly into my ear. Oh, um, yeah, it hurts, but I think I'll be okay. What the hell is this? I asked nervously, but still didn't get an answer. My dear friends and extended family, he called out to the circle. What can be given to someone who has risked so much and asked for so little in return? What can be said to thank someone who gives without the expectation of reward? What can replace the irreplaceable that was lost? Find a path home for the missing? And most importantly, what could rightfully be asked of someone who has already sacrificed so heavily? The answer is nothing. Jose, nobody here has any right to ask any more of you ever again. You remember that, young man? He said as he placed both hands on my shoulders. Absolutely nothing. Do you understand? He asks as he looked me directly in the eye. I guess so, I answered with a small nod. Good, he said cheerfully as he turned back towards the crowd. It has been many, many years since I first stood on this exact spot and met the woman who would become my wife. He continued as Tiger Lily finally made her way to join us in the center of the circle. On that day, she presented me with a gift. At first, I thought it was a simple trade for a pretty old whale's tooth. It wasn't until later that I was to learn it was because, as I handed it to her and our fingers touched, she knew that I was going to go on to do great things. Important things. Things that otherwise would have occurred long after I was gone. Slain by old age and buried by time. So she ran to her hut and returned with a small trinket. Well, that's what I thought of it at the time. He kept speaking as he reached under his shirt and withdrew a necklace of shimmering beads. I recognized it. I'd seen it on the first day we met. He was wearing it then too. And that's when I looked over at Tiger Lily, who was now right next to me. She was holding another in her hands as Hook spoke. Oh, hey, that's cool. They making me an honorary member of the tribe or something? I thought to myself, and then Hook spoke again, snapping my attention back to him. As she placed this around my neck, she said to me that as long as I had this, that the island would grant me a long and healthy life. It has been over 200 years since that day. I nearly broke my neck from the force of it spinning to face him when I heard those words leave his mouth. I started to speak, but before I could, I saw Tiger Lily's arm pass in front of my face as she placed something around my neck and said something in a language I couldn't understand. Jose, Sadden. She said that as long as you keep this necklace, the island will grant you a long and healthy life. And now that I'm saying that, this is an honor you have earned. Let nobody say any different. Look out there at those people. He told me as he pointed his silver hand out towards the villages. Each and every one of those people, after they heard what you had done for me, the Count, for your friend Rissa, for the entire world, if we're being frank, they all agreed to give you this gift. Rest assured, they do not give lightly. I, 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 I don't know what to say. I, I stuttered as I felt my knees starting to get weak, and then I looked over at Destiny. That's when I understood. All along, she knew, no matter what, I'd eventually die and leave her alone again. And then, pursuant to that thought, the weight of what just happened hit me. I didn't do it on purpose, but I felt my knees hit the ground as I held the shimmering necklace in my trembling hands. Are you sure about this? I asked, looking back and forth between Hook and Tiger Lily. We're sure, Jose, she answered and smiled down at me. Yes, indeed. Don't worry yourself too much. 
There will, after all, be a conversation to be had after this about the privilege and those who might present a great and noble service to the paranormal world such as yourself. He assured me as he caught my eyes fixed on Rissa. She stood in the circle. Oh, okay, yeah. I guess if it's not that big a deal, I said aimlessly as I tried to collect myself. Oh god, this is all way too much, way too fast. I thought to myself, trying to stand up off the ground. Oh, hell yes. It was probably the next real thought that passed through my mind as I took a bite of some of Tiger Lily's cooking. I don't even know what this is, but it's so good. I said to Rissa as she shoveled food off her own plate and into her mouth. Mm-hmm. I was hoping I'd get to come back here and try more of her cooking. She agreed after a hard gulp. Hmm. Hey, let me see that necklace thingy, she suddenly insisted, sitting the plate down on a nearby table. Oh, yeah, here you go, I said as I stuck my chest out so she could get to it. Huh, it looks so delicate for something so important. She thought out loud as she held it in her hand. Wouldn't it break or something, you know, with all the junk you go through? Hook said I shouldn't worry about it. Said it can't break and the only one who can take it off is the person it belongs to. Go ahead and try, I told her. After a few seconds of struggling, she gave up with a heavy sigh before picking a plate back up. Hmm, guess so. That's neat, she said before looking over my shoulder. Oh, hey, Abigail. I turned to see her walk up behind me with Amika by her side. How's the leg? She asked bluntly once she reached me. Still attached? I asked, picking my foot up off the ground, giving it a good shake. That was crazy. How do you know that would work? I asked him. I didn't. Just suspected it might. She answered with a shrug. Something I heard about when the first vampires were made. It took a while for the whole city to be wiped out. So while that was all happening, he saw someone who was running away like you were. And they accidentally stabbed their arm with an orichalcum tool close to where the infection started. Said it looked like it stopped the infection since it wasn't too far along. Who? Exactly did you hear that from? One of the vampires? No, Yahweh. He was there when it happened. She answered plainly. When would he have... Never mind, don't answer that. I stopped myself from asking any more questions. But... So, if it hadn't have worked, I asked. Yeah, you would have died. It was already in your system and multiplying. If you get the rod, it just slowly melts you away until there's nothing left. Oh. I managed to squeak out as my voice cracked. Well, uh, thank you for stabbing me in the leg, I said, giving her a quick hug. Oh, yeah. Have you talked to Hope yet? Have I? Who? She asked, confused by the random question. Oh, right. The maid. The short version is, she didn't forget her name, Athena just never gave her one. So she decided she wants her name to be Hope? I explained. Ah, uh -huh. I understand. I was never given a proper name myself. This one was given to me much later for convenience, Mika told me. Seeming a little upset that her long-lost sister has suffered the same neglect as she did. Anyway, what about her? Abigail asked to get my attention back. Why do I need to talk to her? Oh, uh, well, I guess you should probably go talk to her and find out, shouldn't you? Ah, uh, fine. She groaned as she walked by, mumbling to herself as she went. Stupid could just tell me, but I gotta walk around for some goddamn... I smiled as she disappeared into the crowd with the cranky sound of a complaining. And that's when I knew it was time to bite the bullet and go find Han. I gotta go find Han, I said to Rissa, who had taken up to brutalizing a roast chicken leg. Still need to tell him something. <laughs> she asked through a mouth full of fowl. It's about who killed Mark. I never got around to telling him, and there's something about what happened to Julie he deserves to know. I told her as I sat down my own empty plate when I had to walk away. I'll come too. She insisted after another hard swallow. You want to set your plate down first? I asked her, 
but after glancing down at it, she shook her head sharply and followed along beside me. But before I could even get to Han, I was accosted by... Oh, hey, Mr. Page, what's up? I asked as he suddenly stepped down in front of me. Nice to see you again, sir. Would it be too terribly bothersome to ask you for a moment of your time? He asked politely as he shook my hand. I assure you, I only need a moment. Yeah, sure, what can I do for you? Ah, well, since you asked... He said as he rang his hands together. Do you remember our little talk we had about the issues of the paranormal world? Oh, yeah, I answered, shuffling nervously in place. What I have to say pertains to that, he said as he took my arm and walked off to the side of the crowd. You're inclined to agree. You see, my employer is set on a course to evaluate the whole paranormal world at every level, overhaul their entire quality of life. But we need certain services and skill sets to set up that along the way. With that in mind, he went on as he reached into his pocket and produced a small black box. Given your education, record, and reputation, we were hoping you would consider our offer, he added as he opened the box. I was looking down at a badge, an ornate golden badge that read, Chief Inspector. We also had your credentials printed as well, just in case, Mr. Page said as he passed me a small laminated card that said at the top, Paranormal Bureau of Public Trust, Department of Investigations and Enforcement. We also attempted to buy you out of your debt with Adeline, but despite the doubling and then tripling of the debt amount in question, she refused. That woman really seems to hate you. As I looked down at the badge and at the card, I remember what Hook told me. He must have known Paige was planning to ask me this. The local community is already sizable. We're having some trouble dealing with the type of issues that are inherent to those numbers, and we expect it to grow rather quickly following current events, strictly speaking. We need your help, Jose. We need your help. Think about it. He finished pushing the badge and card closer towards me before walking back out into the crowd. About an hour later, I found myself sitting on a rock in the dark in the middle of a lagoon I had found some distance from the village. My head rested on my hand as the badge passed through my fingers and the image of the carnage passed through my head. My eyes were closed as the bloody pictures of everyone I'd seen die in the past couple months passed through them. I relived each moment as people were shot, stabbed, eaten, crushed, torn apart. And at the end of every time they made the full loop, the understanding that if I took the offer I'd never get away from all that, it'd haunt me forever. And as I sat there in thought, I heard a soft hiss from behind me before a voice says, Oh, that's where you ran off to. Hey, Hope. I mumbled into my hand as I continued to fiddle with the badge. Just thinking about things. I told her as I heard the sounds of her feet walk up beside me. I think this is the place Hook lost his hand. Seems familiar. They asked you about running the paranormal PD, huh? She asked as she sat down on the grass beside me, not seeming as energetic as she was before. Are you going to? I'm really not sure. I asked her as I passed through the badge what she'd been holding her hand out for. I don't even think I should. I'm not qualified to do something like that, you know? Maybe not. Who really is? She asked back from a place in the ground. At the end of the day, at least you actually care about us. She said as she handed the badge back and vanished into the darkness. You're not going to go see Jekyll before you leave? I asked Mika as I walked with her and Abigail back to the front door of the mansion. He's awake. It had already been several days since the night on the island, and Mika was finally on her way home. She had actually managed to grow on me over the time she was there. 
Dr. Angelin thinks it could be something to do with my own mom being such a poor mother figure that her treating me the same way you treat a child of your own made me see her as a kind of surrogate mom or something. Jose is parent issues, okay? Leave me alone. Hmm, no. I still haven't forgiven him. Perhaps next time. She answered as she reached into a bag and pulled out a red piece of cloth with a golden sparkly pattern on it and handed it to me. Hey, this is what you made me help you sew, right? I asked when I noticed it was the same pattern as a hair bow and the same color as Abigail's sash she wore on the old dress of hers at the festival. Keep an eye on Abigail for me. Make sure she stays out the vaults, she said as she reached up and patted me on the cheek before walking out of the door. It's not like I climbed in there and got locked in, you know, Abigail said, looking up at me. I mean, it wasn't my fault. I believe you, I said. Mick is waiting for you in the car. Yeah, I know. She groaned as she turned and jogged out to Destiny's pink Hurris, which was waiting to drive them to the airport to see Mika off. Okay, kitchen. I thought out loud as I walked deeper into the manor, pausing to watch Poseidon aimlessly wander in the halls, now with a toilet paper turban around his head. At least he's entertaining, I sighed as he scooted by, and then Heb showed up close behind him. Ah, oh, there you are, he exclaimed, clapping his hands together. Hey, sorry about the whole thing with Athena. Nope, I said, holding up a hand to stop him. That's on me. I should have known better from the start. Plenty of red flags were ignored. Besides, me and Louis are kind of tight now, and when we met, he was about to shoot me in the head. So, I don't want to say water under the bridge, but... Oh, well, that's great. Just here. He said as he reached around the corner to pull a large square box around it. She said to give you these to apologize. After me and the blue guy wrung her ass out for what she did. Oh, what? Uh, do I open it now? Well, hell yeah you do open it now. He answered, excitedly scooting the box forward with his foot. The hell is this? I asked as I took the top off and set it to the side. Hey, these, uh... That's a sword and a shield set I made for a long time ago. Some of my best work, even I do say so myself, he said proudly. My heard your brother works for the hotel and your twins. Means he can do some pretty unique things with that tool they carry around. Make a sword and a shield out of it at the same time. Only something twins can do. I've never been able to figure out why. Embarrassing considering I've invented the damn things. Anyway, that ain't all, he told me as he pointed towards a piece of paper taped to lid of the box. Oh, it's a note. Emma Blase unfolded it. She says, huh. She says, offering to teach me to fight on the condition that I take the chief's inspector position. Says I can't, god damn it. Says I can't expect to be a giant pussy and still do the job right. Yep, that sounds like a thing. <laughs> that laughed as he patted me on the back. I ain't be careful with these, buddy. Sharp don't even come close to cover it. He said as he reached into the box and retrieved the sword. Still gotta ask Abigail about Major Payne's knife. I thought to myself as I looked at the weird blade that curved forward like a boomerang, like the one in the movie did. And then I watched as he took a cheap kitchen knife out of the drawer and shaved a sliver of steel off of it with the sword. Yeah, I'll be careful, I whispered as the piece of loose metal clattered against the floor. Oh yeah, I heard what happened to your bike. I was wondering what happened to that old thing. Disappeared off my porch years ago. You want me to make a new one for you? He offered, the act of generosity almost startling me a little. It'd fit better than the last one, too. Oh, you know, actually, I think I'll pass. What? You sure? He asked in disbelief. Yeah, it kills me to say it. But I got two priceless bikes ruined in the course of a few months. Hell, I just ordered a new frame this morning because I don't want anything to happen to the one Madison got me. If this one gets obliterated, I won't be losing much. And it probably will, the way things have been going. I explained, punctuating with a quick shrug. I'm there with you, buddy. Well, you can just call old Hip if you ever need anything. Now, where the hell did Tony get to? He mumbled to himself as he wandered off. I ain't no telling what he's got into now. 
Ah, okay. Food now. I sighed after I was done packing everything back into the box and started open the fridge. But as I reached out and grabbed the handle, I saw the time on my watch. Ah, never mind, I told myself as my hand dropped. So how'd your first appointment go? I asked Hope as soon as she poofed into the middle of the kitchen. Good, I guess. She said, whoa, 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 you don't, you don't have to tell me anything that gets said between you two, right? That wasn't the deal. Just go and talk to her. I interrupted before she could say anything. Yeah, I know, it's fine. She said she thinks it was easier for Yahweh to manipulate me because I was trying to fill some kind of father figure all in my life. He kind of zeroed in on that and took advantage of it. Oh, and she gave me this at the end. But it's sad to wait until I got home to open it. She said as she pulled open the envelope. Let's see what it says. I tried to argue, but she had already opened it. And before I could get the words out, all it was was one word written in huge, bold letters by a black marker and several explanation marks at the end. Bipolar. It was scrawled across the piece of paper as we both looked down at it. Huh. I think this was for me. I thought out loud as I stared at the word. I mean, like, she knew I'd see it. This is actually explaining a lot. I said with that little smile of mine. Well, looks like you're bipolar, I told her, folding a piece of paper back up. That's not too bad. And in the envelope, I saw another piece of paper. A prescription for something called Seroquel. What's that mean? Eh, maybe look into that. I don't think I'd be the best person to explain it, I answered. And in one of the tablets, prophecy is always leaving around the mansion. Oh, yeah, sure. She said as she took it from me. Wait, what's the password? Oh yeah, prophecy told me. Um, Monster Mash. <laughs> she giggled before walking towards the lounge. Hey dad, guess what? I'm bipolar. That's wonderful. What is bipolar? I heard the Count say in the distance. This is going to take some time to get used to. Or her prophecy say from beside me once hope was gone. Yeah... I got that. But thank you. I still miss Faith, but Hope deserves to be part of the family too. Something bothers me though, she said as her tone darkened. Bothers what? It poem. If it wasn't about her, you think it could have been about someone else? Someone worse? She asked a little too nervously. God, I hope not. Maybe it isn't about anyone. Maybe it was just the puddle thinking the pothole made this fit it specifically. We just happened to find a scary poem written by a very disturbed man at the right time to seem like it meant something. Something more than it actually did. But if it was, I guess we'll just have to cross that bridge when we get to it. Hey, Harley. What's got you sneaking around this time of the night? I asked about a week later in the back of an alley on the other side of town. Not easy to get around when everyone's looking for you, is it? What the hell do you want? She snapped after we rounded the corner and almost ran headfirst into each other. Well, technically I'm supposed to charge you for crimes against and involving the paranormal community, I answered, flashing my badge at her with a low smirk. Bring you in to answer for it. Good luck with that. She said bluntly as she turned to skulk away. I was the face. Yeah, we managed to burn off some of that extra nose. Definitely didn't fix the personality. You know what, you smug little prick? She barked as she stomped towards me, hand raised. You... You just can't leave it alone, can you? Just can't let things be. Every time I have something good going, you come along and fuck it up for me. And now look at you. I had my face burned to hell and back. I lost everything. And now you're standing there with your stupid little badge and smug look on your face. But I'll get you back, Jose. I'm not sure how. But when you finally relax and start enjoying your life, when you have something really worth losing, I'll find a way to take it from you. And you'll look back on this moment and wish you just kept your mouth shut. I'm going to make you suffer, Jose. 
I'm going to make you suffer. If you think what happened to Julie was bad, just you wait. By the time she was done, she'd already started to back away down the alley, and the smirk left my face. Technically, I'm supposed to charge you for your crimes and bring you in to answer for them, in the event that I'm able to find you. I said as the humor completely left my voice, and she continued to back away. But it looks like I wasn't able to in time. Goodbye, Holly. I told her as her back made contact with the figure behind her. It was Han Lau, who had been standing there unnoticed in the shadows through most of her tirade. I walked away from that alley and never saw her again, never knowing what happened to her after that moment. I just left her to her fate. People wanted justice for Mark, but Han wanted justice for Julie more. After that, it seemed like everything had finally calmed down. No major trouble. The paranormal community had settled back down, and like Paige said, began to grow a little by little. Jekyll made a full recovery. All seemed well in the world. And then, seemingly out of nowhere, those three idiots showed up. Help support the author on Patreon. Link in the description below.